It's now time for member statements. The member for Essex. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Speaker. Uh, Speaker, I want to tell members of this House about two men from my riding of Essex County, Tim Papineau <clears throat> and Chris Appleyard. Tim uh, was a firefighter with uh, Windsor Fire and Rescue, and Curtis was an iron worker who was working on the job in Welland. Both men were young, both men were loved, and loved their families. Uh, both men had so much more to offer, and both men died as a result of the work that they do and did. Uh, one, one from what could not be uh, foreseen, and the other because of something that he could not unsee. And I talk about these two gentlemen today, Speaker, because uh, I think both of these, these deaths were preventable. I think that in this House, uh, we can uh, make all the overtures that we want, we can pass all the bills that we want, we can impose all the regulations we want, uh, but unless there is a concerted effort to enforce those laws, to put the resources behind the health and safety uh, legislation that we put out that has real effect in our communities, unless we put the enforcement measures in place, we'll continue to see these deaths, and I, I'm tired of it. I don't want to hear a roll call of people we've lost in our communities because they went to work. We have to do better, Speaker. And, and dedicating a day in, of the month as Health and Safety Day does not go far enough. We have to impose and, and implement the resources that are available uh, to ensure that these workers are sell, safe and have the protections when they go to work. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. The member for Kitchener. Conestoga. Well, th thank you, uh, Speaker Nichols. I mean, Speaker. Uh, <laughs> well, thank you, Speaker. Like so many of my fellow members, I was absolutely thrilled when our government committed to providing low income seniors with access to publicly funded, high quality dental care. Over the past year and a half, the low income seniors in my riding have made it clear to me that financial obstacles are preventing them from visiting the dentist regularly. I've heard from Pauline and her husband, seniors in Baden who reached out to me to tell me how much they could use these services. Sandy from Kitchener told me how relieved she is that her mother will finally be able to get the dental care she needs. For the first time ever, eligible seniors will have coverage for, for a comprehensive range of preventative and restorative dental services. We all know how much pain something like a cavity can cause if left untreated. I don't think that I need to remind the members in this chamber that untreated cavities can lead to chronic disease was happy to be able to share with my constituents last week that seniors can now apply to our government's new Ontario Seniors Dental Care Program through their public health unit and Ontario.ca. On behalf of my constituents in Kitchener-Conestoga, I would like to thank the Minister of Health, the Honourable Christine Elliott, and the Minister of Seniors and Accessibility, the Honourable Raymond Cho, for all their hard work on this file. With our government's record spending in health care and education, we are protecting what matters most for the people of Ontario. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Member statements, the member for London West. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Speaker, this government's decision to slash Conservation Authority flood control budgets by 50 per cent, while also directing no increases to municipal levies, is putting Ontarians' lives and property at risk. In my community, the Upper Thames River Conservation Authority has warned that it is simply not possible to absorb the loss of half of its flood control budget without cutting key flood management services such as flood forecasting and warning systems. In the face of a climate emergency that is increasing the frequency and severity of extreme weather events, it is incomprehensible that this government is cutting funding for essential flood control. But it gets worse, Speaker. Conservation authorities have also been directed to stop all non-mandatory programs, even though these programs receive no provincial funding whatsoever. For Upper Thames River, this means the loss of programs on water quality monitoring and improvement, on tree planting and woodlot management, on invasive species, on species at risk, on curriculum-based environmental education, on trail development, and programs in support of local environmental initiatives. Speaker, instead of listening to climate deniers, I call on this government to join the fight against climate change, help protect Ontarians from flooding, and support the vital work of local conservation authorities like Upper Thames River to protect our communities and preserve our planet. Thank you, Speaker. 
Member statements. The member for Ottawa West Nepean. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I am pleased to rise today to recognize the accomplishments of a dedicated public servant, mentor, and friend. Last week, Claude Bennett, the former member for Ottawa South, was awarded the Order of Ottawa. Claude has had an impressive career of public service. He served on Ottawa City Council from 1961 to 1971, representing Capitol Ward and serving as acting mayor. He was elected to this legislature in 1971 and served until 1987. During that time, he spent 14 years in the cabinet of Premier Bill Davis, filling the roles of Minister of Tourism and Recreation, Minister of Municipal Housing and uh, Affairs and Housing, and Minister of Industry. His accomplishments are numerous and include getting the Ottawa Heart Institute and the Ottawa Courthouse built and securing funding for the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario's expansion. On a personal note, I will say that Claude has been an invaluable source of wisdom and advice to me as I start my political journey, and for that, I am eternally grateful to him. Please join me in warmly congratulating Claude on this very well-deserved honour. Thank you. Member Statements. Member for Hamilton West, Ancaster Dundas. Mr. Speaker, uh, right this very minute, so many people in Ontario are experiencing water issues. We have lead in our schools, continued mercury poisoning in grassy narrows and carcinogens in Tottenham. Nestle continues to drain our aquifers, producing over 3 billion plastic water bottles in Aberfoyle since 2016. Every day in this House, my colleague and my friend, MPP Mamakwa, raises the appalling lack of clean drinking water in First Nations communities. And now in Hamilton, in my riding of Hamilton West, Ancaster, Dundas, a truly heartbreaking environmental disaster, 24 billion litres of raw sewage seeped into our beautiful Coots paradise. I'd like to use my time today to recognize and to thank Indigenous women, our water protectors, who have been at the forefront of these water issues. A poignant example of the power of water protectors is that of Kristen Villebrun and Wendy Bush, OG Cree women. In November 2015, these women staged a protest to address sewage waste in Hamilton's harbour and the lack of governmental action to address it. These women sounded the alarm, yet their voices went unheard and unheeded. It is time for all of us to listen to the voices of those on the front lines and commit to protecting our water. Ontarians deserve to know what's in our water. Next, we have the member for Guelph. Thank you, Speaker. Today, I met with two of the youth taking the government to court over its withdrawal of climate solutions, which jeopardizes our charter-protected rights of life, liberty, and security of the person. Zoe and Madison came to my office this morning to share their concerns about the future. I want to quote what Zoe said. I'm afraid that so many species that I love will go extinct and that children in the future won't be able to enjoy nature the same way I do." End quote. A future this government is actively working against by tearing down wind turbines and relying on climate denial blogs to inform policy. This week, scientists issued their most urgent warning yet that we're headed for 3.2 degrees Celsius warming if we don't triple our efforts. These kids should not have to resort to the courts to compel this government to act. So no matter how many times the minister invokes my name in this house when talking about the government's environment plan, the bottom line is it's not going to deliver the solutions this province needs and our children deserve. So for the sake of these young people, I will continue to keep fighting and pushing for climate action. And I want to thank Sophia, Madison, Alex, Shelby, Zoe, Shaylin, and Bays for having the courage to stand up and take this government to court demanding climate action. Thank you, Speaker. The member for Markham Thornhill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm, I'm very happy to rise today to speak about Future Possibility for Kids, an organization in my riding that empowers the youth 
teach leadership skills to children aged 9 to 12. Mr. Speaker, since 2001, over 5,000 youth have participated in this amazing organization. They provide year-round leadership program, helping children to build self-confidence, creative thinking, and a positive outlook on their life. At Future Possibility for Kids, youth work one-on-one -on -one with coaches to develop personal goals that will make an impact on their community. Mr. Speaker, one example that stands out for me is how the group of children made their summer goal to deliver Kedwell card to sick patient at Markham Stowell Hospital. Another youth began an anti-bullying campaign at their school, with another student created the plan to clean up local park. This program saw kids that they can be a change makers and inspiration to others. Mr. Speaker, organizations like Future Possibility for Kids are an inspiration for all of us. I hope that my colleagues and I can lead by example and inspire just to reach for their goals. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Member statements, the member for Thornhill. Davenport, Davenport. Good afternoon, Mr. Speaker. I'm grateful for the opportunity to rise today to salute one of our province's big, biggest creative hubs, my riding of Davenport. Davenport is home to thousands of workers in the creative sector, from fine artists and musicians to production designers, writers, actors, directors, and game designers. We are proud that a vibrant arts corridor has grown along the West Toronto rail path, anchored by the Museum of Contemporary Art and cutting-edge private galleries like Scrap Metal, TPW, Daniel Faria, and Clint Ronish. In the Junction Triangle, the Inuit Art Foundation operates in a new home just down the street from galleries including Aaron Stump Projects, Angel Gallery, and Cooper Cole, renowned artist-run centres, Mercer Union and Art Metropole, also called Davenport Home. But, Speaker, while creative workers in our community contribute so much, they remain some of the most vulnerable workers in our province. They face challenges finding and keeping affordable places to live and work as rents keep rising and development pushes them out of our neighbourhoods. And this government's $10 million cut to the Ontario Arts Council will mean fewer jobs, smaller grants, and less opportunity in the sector. Artists and cultural workers deserve a provincial government that invests in them. By making housing more affordable, by extending benefits and workplace protections to contract workers, and by supporting the institutions that show their work. Speaker, it's time for a government that showed up for artists. Thank you. Next, we have the member for Peterborough Kawartha. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The United Way of Peterborough and District provides funding for 46 different programs and services within the city and county of Peterborough. Some of the organizations that receive their support are Big Brothers and Big Sisters, the Youth Emergency Shelter, and the Canadian Mental Health Association. On November 17th, I had the opportunity to partner with the United Way and one of our local sledge hockey associations, the Kawartha Blazers, to hold the first ever Dave Smith, United Way Sledge Hockey Challenge. <laughs> this event featured a number of MPPs, local politicians, Blazers players, and some, some other celebrities from our community. And it did two things for us. First, we were able to raise close to $20,000 that will be directed back into our community in support of the great work of organizations like I've already mentioned with, with what they do. Secondly, this provided us with an opportunity to raise awareness about the struggles that someone with a mobility issue has when they're trying to play Canada's favourite pastime. For those of you who have never tried sledge hockey, let me describe it to you. You play while seated in a sledge. It's a specially designed sled with two blades on the ice. You propel yourself around the ice using picks that are attached to the ends of your sticks. As the goalie, I was quite effective in stacking the pads by flopping onto my side. Unfortunately, I wasn't as successful in getting back upright once I had flopped over, and I dare say that fact was reflected in the scoreboard. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Next, we have the member for Flamborough Glanbrook. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm rising today to speak to the reason that many of us are wearing these ribbons today. It's scleroderma. Scleroderma affects approximately 6,000 Ontarians. It's a, a rare, chronic, multi-symptom autoimmune disease that affects the body's connective tissue. The cause of scleroderma is unknown, and currently there is no cure. 
But, Mr. Speaker, there are treatments that can help slow the process down and improve the quality and quantity of life for persons who are affected by the disease. But these can be costly or difficult to access. Mr. Speaker, Ontarians living with this rare and debilitating condition face significant physical and emotional challenges, often resulting in feelings of helplessness, hopelessness, and being a burden to society. But with despair, there is hope. The Scleroderma Society of Ontario is an organization that is focused on raising awareness, raising funds, and raising support for those with this disease in an effort to find a cure. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank John Malcolmson and Maureen Sauve and the entire team at the Scleroderma Society of Ontario who are here at Queen's Park today. They are dedicated leaders in the fight to find a cure for this little-known but disabling disease. And finally, I would like to invite all members in this House to drop by the Scleroderma reception at 5 o'clock this afternoon in the Legislative Dining Room. Thank you. Thank you very much. That concludes our member statements for this afternoon.